So far we have been working a lot with basis functions. They allow us to map our data to new feature spaces in which the problem that we're trying to solve becomes easier. And then our linear models so far were explicitly parameterized by a set of weights, where essentially a weight was assigned to each feature value. Uh, but we also saw some previews that indicated that we could alternatively rewrite our predictive models purely in terms of the data points themselves, via the so-called equivalent kernel. Now, this week we will expand in the direction of this kernel viewpoint, in which we do not explicitly work with model parameters. This week we focus on what we call non-parametric models. Okay, so this is what we have been doing so far. We've been working with a fixed set of basis functions uh, to map our inputs x to this vector of uh, new feature values. And then we use this new representation to do linear regression or uh, linear classification. So we build this linear regression model really via this uh, linear function mapping parameterized by this uh, set of weights w uh, plus this bias term. And in the classification setting we consider linear classification models uh, because this linear part in the end results in some linear decision boundary. Uh, but this f actually uh, turns this linear part into a nonlinear thing, for example a probability. Now the reason for working with basis function was uh, let's say we have this one dimensional case with uh, let's say data points of one class over here and over here and then let's say if the other class my points were over here and we're building a, a linear classification model I cannot place a decision boundary that perfectly separates the two classes uh, but if I map these feature values so these points lie on some axis uh, x if I map them to a new space let's just say I perform the mapping x squared so this will be uh, my feature vector, uh, component 1 for example, is given by x squared. Then my original data points are mapped well, to this uh, parabola and that actually leads to the result that now in my new feature space I can draw a clear uh, decision boundary that separates the two classes. Okay, so that's what we've been do doing so far. So we mapped our uh, original features to a new uh, feature representation via these basis functions uh, because then we can still work with this relatively simple model like linear regression or uh, linear models for classification. But then of course such an approach highly relies on uh, choosing, choosing appropriate basis functions, right? So uh, we also looked at in the case of actually learning these basis functions via neural networks where this first layer of the neural network uh, could be thought of as a learned basis function, um, let's say the empty basis function that maps a particular x to a particular value and then my uh, regression or classification is then based on a linear combination of these learned basis functions. Now in the upcoming videos we're going to revisit these basis functions and how to design them or how to choose them. But the main commonality between all these uh, models is that they are explicitly parameterized by, the set, by a set of model parameters W. So what we've been uh, focusing on is, is actually finding this optimal set of Ws and we could adopt a probabilistic viewpoint where we um, use the maximum likelihood approach, a maximum posterior approach to obtain a point estimate for W, so a single set of parameters W that describes my model. Or we could do this in a full probabilistic way uh, where we consider, let's say, a probability for each, each choice of W that I can make. So in the maximum likelihood case, I make a point estimate for W and for in the full Bayesian case I consider a posterior distribution for my model parameters W. So this distribution is tuned uh, to my data set. So and then you could say that at test time you can essentially discard the training data. I'm done, I know how to pick my W or I already picked my uh, W or I, I have a probability distribution that describes which uh, W I should use uh, from now on. Okay, so what I've described so far can be considered as parametric models. So those are models with a finite number of parameters. And then we have what we call non-parametric models. So those are essentially models that do not rely on an explicit definition of, of parameters. And in the upcoming videos I will show that for each of such non-parametric models we can equivalently define some parametric models that really de is defined by a set of, of model parameters. But by resorting to this non-parametric uh, viewpoint, uh, it allows us to actually work with models that implicitly, so not explicitly, but implicitly work with an infinite number of parameters. So that is obviously untractable when you work in this parametric uh, model viewpoint, but in this kernel uh, 
based viewpoint or this non-parametric model viewpoint, we can actually do this thing. So the main point then is that with parametric models, we work in a finite dimensional parameter space. So we just search for the optimal set of parameters. And then the non-parametric viewpoint, uh, you can sort of think of this as uh, trying to pick models out of this infinite dimensional space of functions that perform the task that we want to do. And at this point, maybe that sounds a bit abstract working with these function spaces, uh, but it will become clear in the upcoming videos, especially in the next lecture, so lecture 12, uh, when we talk about Gaussian processes. And then the approach that we take to uh, non-parametric modeling is via Kernel methods. So in uh, these methods, they base their predictions not uh, on a set of model parameters, Ws, but they base their predictions on my available training data. And we encountered this idea before when we talked about the so-called equivalent kernel in video uh, 5.1. So the idea is that we have a, a linear parametric model. So it's uh, parametrized by a set of weights W. And we saw that such linear models can be recast into a equivalent dual representation. And in this video, I'm going to explain what I mean with, with such a dual representation. But the main point is that now in such a dual representations, uh, my predictions are based on a linear combination um, of the kernel function evaluated at data points. So I have my, all my data points and then my prediction is based on the linear combinations of these uh, data points via the kernel functions, where this linear combination is weighted by, with this uh, dual representation A. So we have some duality of how we represent our models. So we either do this via um, explicitly via my model parameters W or via a factor A that is used in a weighted sum of my predictions for each data point. Okay, and so we do this via uh, the kernel function. Um, so this kernel is essentially defined as the scalar product between this feature factor uh, for one data point uh, with the feature factor for another data point. So this is what we define uh, the kernel to be. Okay, and then it turns out that with such a kernel functions, uh, we can obtain a dual representation of my uh, linear models where my predictions are based on uh, the kernel evaluations for my existing data point relative to, well, the, the point that I'm testing for now, weighted with a corresponding set of weights uh, uh, encoded in this dual representation A. And now you should think of this kernel as measuring the similarity between two data points. And, and in that sense, uh, if I have to make a prediction for a particular data point, let's say x prime, then I'm going to compare how much it looks like uh, my original or one of my data points in my uh, training set. And now the similarity then in the end determines how much my prediction is based on this particular data point. Okay, so this kernel is some sort of a similarity measure in the feature space defined by this mapping uh, phi of x. So this is essentially an inner product between such feature factors and this kernel uh, can be thought of as a sort of generalized inner product or a nonlinear version of the, uh, the inner product. Okay, so now let's make this a bit more explicit. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going over the example of a uh, rich regression and I'm going to derive a dual formulation. So I'm going to express my linear model. Uh, so uh, this is essentially my linear model. I'm going to express it in terms of this kernel. Now, first of all, um, when we choose a set of parameters w, we minimize some objective of some error function, right? So we're now going to minimize this least squared error. So we want our model uh, for a given input x uh, to map closely to a corresponding target. And I want to minimize the error that my prediction makes uh, relative to well, my ground root target. And in order to prevent overfitting, I'm going to include this L2 uh, or this rich regression uh, penalty, right? So this prevents my weights of becoming too large and therefore it has this uh, regularization effect which prevents overfitting. So then the general strategy as always is uh, we try to solve this. This is a convex optimization problem. So if we can find a stationary point of this thing, so if we can find uh, the W for which the derivative of my error function is zero, then we have obtained a globally optimal set of uh, parameters W. Okay, so let's do this computation. So we take the derivative of J with respect to W um, so that gives me uh, this particular thing over here and we set it to, to zero and now we solve it for W and we start off with the following. So we're going to factorize this. So we want to have this W up front because it shows up here and here. So let's do that. So I can do it by writing an identity over here. 
right? Because it doesn't change my uh, vector uh, w. So and then I can move this w outside and factorize it in the following way. And what I also did in this step, I moved the sum over my tn's to the other side, a uh, side of the equation sign. Okay, and then from moving from here to here, I applied this trick, which we've also been doing a lot, like changing the order in a scalar product uh, can simply be done, changing the order and then switching the transposes. And that allows me to move this w to the other side. And I do that because now I have something in the form, let's say, a x is b, then that means x is a inverse b. So that's essentially this particular um, step over here. And that gives me the solution for W. So we can write it in the following form. And to make it a bit more convenient for ourselves, we work with this matrix vector uh, notation. So our derivative in terms of this matrix vector notation is given as followed, uh, follows where we have uh, relied on the definition of this uh, design matrix. And this design matrix stores all the feature vectors for each data point, right? So this uh, particular uh, matrix is an N by M uh, matrix. So it has N rows, so N data points, and each for, for each data point, I have M of these feature vectors. So when working with these uh, design matrix, I can formulate um, my solution in terms of this uh, design matrix as follows. Where here, I'm taking the inverse over an M by M matrix because in this matrix matrix multiplication, I sum essentially over this n axis. So I sum over all the data points, uh, the outer product of these uh, feature vectors. Okay, so our goal was to minimize this sum of squared errors, which had this uh, quadratic uh, weight penalty. And we just derived a solution to be of the following form. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to just rewrite this particular solution uh, via a matrix inversion lemma, such that in the end we can write it uh, using this this kernel uh, notation. So in the end, we want to write things in, in terms of this kernel, and this kernel encodes all the inner product between basis functions, whereas so far, these uh, matrices were based on the outer product of, of uh, the basis functions. Now, I don't want you to remember this particular formula over here, but I do want you to remember, and whoops, there's a minus sign missing over here. I do want you to remember that uh, we can rewrite this inversion or this matrix into a, a new form via this formula. So there's many identities for rewriting uh, inverses of matrices, and now we're going to rely on this particular one, where we fill in uh, p minus one with lambda i, uh, b that will be my design matrix, and r will be the identity matrix um, for n data points. So for example, this b is phi transpose, this r is r inverse, that's essentially i the identity, and then we have phi, uh, we have p inverse, so that's lambda i m inverse of this thing and so on and essentially this allows us to rewrite uh, the expression for w in the following way so where we now see that this particular matrix product now is transposed to the following form where we have uh, phi identity doesn't do anything and then phi transpose so that gives me the following expression and now we've written uh, this matrix product in the following form, which we can replace with our definition of the kernel. Okay, so uh, what we did, we just rewrote the expression or solution for W such that we have this kernel popping up over here. Okay, so we just obtained that our solution W can also be expressed in terms of this kernel. And now if we make the following definition, so let's call this particular thing, let's call it uh, a, my dual variable, so th that's just a definition that I make for the moment, then we can say that my solution w is obtained via this mapping from my dual parameter via this design matrix. So we have this dual representation between A and W via this design matrix uh, using my definition of the dual variable. Now we can call these things like the primal variable uh, w because that's the thing that we're mainly interested in, that's uh, what we started off with uh, that defines our model. Uh, but equivalently, we can also maybe talk about a dual variable, which actually represents, in the end, the same model, the same thing, uh, but in terms of this A. But you could also approach this from an optimization point of view, where you say, okay, my main objective is to minimize this particular functional, which I can formulate in a constraint optimization problem, introducing this parameter Z, uh, basically here inside this uh, squared error. 
So this is the thing that you minimize in the constraint that set is my original thing and I have this regularization term. And then when you talk about constraint optimization problems, you can talk about uh, a dual problem, which when you solve this dual problem, you actually have solved your original problem. And it turns out that this is the corresponding dual uh, Lagrangian or the du dual objective that you want to minimize. And uh, the minimizer of this dual uh, optimization uh, problem leads to this particular dual variable. So we will look into this primal dual uh, viewpoints in, in one of the upcoming videos as well. But for now, it's sufficient to know that I can have a primal variable, which really represents my model in its original form, but I also have a dual representation, which actually gives me the same model in the end. But this one is based on the kernel and this one is based explicitly on these uh, basis functions. So they both rep represent the same thing. We have my primal view viewpoint, which is a uh, linear model described by my set of parameters W. So that's the, the form that we've been used to seeing. But now if we insert this expression for W based on my dual variable in here, then I can show that we can rewrite it in the following way. And this shows that in my dual formulation, my predictions for a new data point X prime are based on my original data points Xn via this kernel weighted with the corresponding uh, dual variables. Okay, so what I just did, I started off with my ridge regression problem. So that, that essentially results in a linear model of the following form. And I showed that we can equivalently also describe such a model if I had this dual viewpoints where my predictions are no longer based on a, a weighted sum of my feature values, but my predictions are based on a weighted sum of my kernel values uh, for each uh, data point. Okay, now let's take a look at what this implies from a computational point of view. So in uh, the dual approach, my dual parameters, which really describe my model in the end, are, are obtained by uh, solving this particular inversion uh, problem. So we need to take the inverse of this kernel plus lambda i n. And because this is a matrix of size n by n, uh, the, essentially the, the, the computational cost for obtaining my a is of order n to the power 3, because this is the computational complexity of taking an inverse. Then in my primal uh, viewpoint, I have to take the inverse of an m by m matrix. Um, so that is that's actually much cheaper, right? Because typically you have uh, less uh, feature vectors than you have uh, data points. Now, what does this look like from uh, once you have obtained such a model, you want to make predictions. Then you can show that uh, in the dual case, uh, my predictions are of order n by m because I have to evaluate m multiplications inside this kernel, right? Because this was the inner product for e with each feature vector with the feature vector of the input uh, data point. Uh, so, and I have to do that n times uh, in order to compute uh, all the multiplications in this uh, sum. And then in the primal case, this computation is just of order m, right? Because I just have to multiply uh, my weights, each weight, so I have m of such weights and I multiply them m times with the corresponding uh, feature values. Okay, so this really makes you wonder why do we want to resort uh, to this dual viewpoint at all, considering that the computational cost associated with it uh, is, such, is, is that high, right? Because usually you would have way more data points than you have um, uh, model parameters. And then the main reason is that in this dual approach, I actually do not explicitly need all these parameters, which means that in theory, I can also go, I can use feature vectors of size which are maybe infinite dimensional. So you can, with such kernel approaches, I can maybe work with kernels which have, let's say, an infinite amount of uh, feature values, and therefore they can be extremely powerful, right? They can represent all sorts of uh, decision boundaries or regression models. So as we will see, by resorting to this uh, kernel viewpoint, we can obtain very powerful methods. Okay, and then such a uh, kernel methods do not re rely on the explicit computation of features or the explicit definition of features, but are rather on the similarity kernel. And well, equally as for the basis functions, there are some heuristics on choosing, uh, choosing basis functions. We also have something similar for uh, defining your kernel functions. And actually it turns out that there is one particular kernel function which is able to represent all sorts of functions. So it is, it's actually not too hard to design your, your kernel method. But yeah, then these dual methods, they can be slow at predictions, uh, as we uh, see looking at these computational orders. Uh, but what we will uh, discuss in one of the upcoming videos, we're going to look at a kernel method, which is based on sparse solutions. So I have a sparse set of uh, ANs of uh, what we call support vectors. 
which define my prediction. So I do not have to evaluate this sum for all data points. Basically, this tells me with these sparse solutions that my predictions are obtained with only, let's say, a couple of uh, data points which have non-zero uh, support values. And with support values, I mean uh, these AN, so these dual variables. So if we call the number of non-zero uh, dual variables N prime, and let's say uh, we only have a few of them which are non-zero. That essentially means that I only need to perform the sum for the, the ANs which are non-zero. So the computational cost then associated with these sparse solutions will be of order N prime uh, times M. Uh, so uh, at test time, these models are actually not too much demanding and are actually close to the computational order of my uh, primal case. Now, the purpose of the upcoming videos will in the end uh, be to derive such kernel methods which have sparse, sparse solutions and such methods will be called, called uh, support factor machines.